please bury me in this cardigan because it is going to be the coolest piece of clothing that I ever own. Unless I go to space and get a spacesuit. In which case, bury me in the spacesuit with this over the top. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Hey guys, welcome back to The Stemulus. I'm Steph Evs, and welcome to my newest segment here on the channel, STEM History. These videos will be all about people in STEM that you may not have heard about. I know for me personally, the only non-white male STEM type person I ever learned about for most of my youth was Marie Curie. So let's see if we can change that here. So who is the first person I'm gonna be talking about? None other than this motorcycle racing, aeronautical engineering badass. Meet Beatrice Schilling. Aside from having the coolest Wikipedia picture of all time, she is most well known for inventing a fix for the Rolls-Royce Merlin engines that were used in the Royal Air Force, or RAF, Hawker, Hurricane, and Supermarine Spitfire fighter planes during World War II. The fix kept the engines from losing power or stalling during certain combat maneuvers because, you know, the last thing you want when you're flying an airplane is for the engine to just stop. The legend of this legend begins in Waterlooville, Hampshire, where Beatrice was born on March 8, 1909. At age 14, she got sick of her sisters being faster than her on her bicycle, so she did what any reasonable girl her age might do and bought herself a Royal Enfield motorcycle and taught herself how to take it completely apart and put it back together. For those of you unaware, tinkering is the first symptom of engineering, usually exhibited during childhood. I myself first started showing signs when I blew a breaker in her house after experimenting with the electrical wiring in a light socket. On that day, I learned never to touch white and green together. But I digress. Beatrice went on to complete secondary school and then began working for an electrical engineering company as an apprentice for the next three years, installing wiring and generators. Her employer, also a woman, which is really cool, especially for the time period, encouraged Beatrice to pursue studies in electrical engineering. Beatrice took this advice, got a loan from the National Society for Women's Service to pay the tuition fees, and went on to receive a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Manchester in 1932. Then she stayed an extra year to research internal combustion engines to get a master's degree in mechanical engineering. Now, some of you may be thinking, overachiever, but as a woman in the early 20th century, this is what it took to become an engineer. On top of being a woman, Beatrice had to contend with the fact that it was the freaking Great Depression when finding a job after college. She was able to find a job as a research assistant at the University of Birmingham, and in 1936, she was hired as a technical writer at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, or RA. AE, which served as the research and development agency for the RAF. Eventually, she advanced to the role of experimental engineer. While working there, she quickly earned a reputation as a take-no-crap kind of engineer that pushed back against authority, but also had an excellent hands-on approach. While Beatrice was busy becoming a super awesome engineer, she hadn't lost her love of motorcycles. In fact, during the 1930s, Beatrice began racing and winning. In fact, she beat the pants off pros such as Nobel Pope and was awarded the gold star for lapping the Brooklyn circuit at 106 miles per hour on her Norton motorcycle. With this, she became the fastest female racer ever at the track. She also began racing cars, specifically her tuned up Lagonda Rapier, and loved to rip around the Silverstone track at speeds of over 100 miles per hour. Beatrice also met her husband in the 1930s, who also worked for the RAE. She allegedly refused to marry him until he too had won the gold star for lapping the Brooklyn circuit at over 100 miles per hour. Then along came World War II, and thus the need for fighter planes. In 1940, RAF pilots had an unpleasant surprise when they discovered that the Merlin engines installed in their fighters would stall when the plane would dive in combat. When the pilot would move the stick forward to begin a dive, the plane would experience a negative g-force, which would starve the engine of fuel, and when the pilot would pull out of the dive, the engine would be flooded with fuel, causing the engine to lose power. This would be bad because A, the enemy would escape or close in, but more importantly because B, the carburetor valve would open and flood the carburetor with fuel. The carburetor is the part of the engine responsible for regulating the fuel to air ratio in the engine for combustion, so if things aren't balanced, it's no bueno for the engine. 
The type of carburetors used in the Merlin engines were what's known as float type carburetors. These carburetors relied on a float that operates a valve that keeps the fuel ratio in the carburetor at the value it needs to be. If too much fuel gets in, the float rises and restricts the fuel flow into the float chamber. If there's not enough fuel coming in, the float will sink and allow more in. As you can probably guess, this type of carburetor really relies on gravity in order to function properly. And when you're diving and inverting and doing all sorts of crazy maneuvers in a dogfight, gravity doesn't exactly become the most reliable thing, which means you've got problems. More specifically, this would cause the engine to cut out mid-flight, which in terms of places for an aircraft engine to stop working, this would probably rank as the worst. Needless to say, it didn't take the Germans long to figure out that the British fighters had this problem and they began exploiting it. But one thing the Germans didn't count on was Beatrice. She came up with the RAE restrictor in order to temporarily solve this problem. The restrictor was a small metal disc with a hole in the middle that would fit into the engine's carburetor and restrict the amount of fuel able to flow into the carburetor, preventing the flooding problem. In 1941, Beatrice led a small team to RAF fighter bases to install the device into the engines. The pilots were huge fans and named the restrictor the Tilly Orifice for Beatrice's childhood nickname or the less giggle-inducing Schilling's Penny since the restrictor was roughly the size of a three penny or shilling bit. While this was an improvement, it did have limitations. While certain negative G maneuvers used in dogfights could be performed, inverted flight for any length of time was still not possible. This temporary fix was used until the introduction and implementation of the pressure carburetor in 1943. Beatrice's work didn't end with the war. Following World War II, she moved to the Supersonics Division and then the Mechanical Engineering Department at the RAE and worked on several other projects, such as the Blue Streak Missile, a medium-range ballistic missile, cabin air conditioning, internal cooling of high-speed aircraft, solid fuel rockets, and the effects a wet runway has on aircraft braking, just to name a few. Shilling refused to believe that women were inferior to men in STEM fields, and she continued working for the RAE until 1969 and managed to rise to a senior position in the Mechanical Engineering Department. Throughout her career, she earned recognition and several honors, including receiving an honorary doctorate from the University of Surrey and even had a pub named after her. PhD, pub named in her honor, but it's a win-win. She was also a member of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and the Women's Engineering Society. Even after she retired, Beatrice served as a consultant in the aerospace industry. The racing wasn't over either. After the war, Beatrice returned to racing cars, which she and her husband worked on tirelessly in their workshop at home. They still raced the Lagonda Rapier and went on to race an Austin Healey Sebring Sprite between 1959 and 1960, frequently placing at least third and even winning once. During her retirement years, she continued to zip around at top speeds in her Triumph Dolomite Sprint, but that wasn't exactly in a racing environment. Beatrice Schilling played an important role in paving the way for female engineers in the mid-20th century. She was known for not taking crap from anyone, even if they outranked her. She defied conventions for the time with her hobbies, her attitude, and her approach to engineering. Her numerous contributions in the aerospace field still have value in modern aircraft design and paved the way for female aerospace engineers like, well, me. So that brings us to our question of the day. Since this is a new series, what person from STEM history do you think deserves more recognition? Let me know in the comments section down below. If you think Beatrice Schilling is as cool as I do and want to learn more about her, I will include links to my sources down below along with links to all of my social media pages, so feel free to check that out in your free time. If you like this video and you want to see where this series goes, please feel free to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any of the awesome STEM related content. But as always, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. Stay well, stay awesome, and I will see you next time.